Hi, my name is Alex Watson. I'm a co-founder at Gretel AI. Today, we're going to start with an overview of synthetic data, what it is, some of the popular use cases that we're seeing around synthetic data, and also from our research, how synthetic data is capable of outperforming real-world data for some machine learning tasks. For a little background on Gretel, we are a startup that helps developers and data scientists build with synthetic data. Starting at the very top, what is synthetic data? I like this definition from NVIDIA. Synthetic data is annotated information that computer simulations or algorithms generate as an alternative to real-world data. The concept of synthetic data is nothing that's new. It's been around for tens of years, really since the first time that someone had to create an artificial data set or one that didn't exist to demonstrate a solution to a problem. What is fascinating about synthetic data are the recent advancements we've had in machine learning, whether we're dealing with language models, whether we're dealing with generative adversarial networks or other types of models. We've created the ability for machine learning models to learn the insights and the distributions and to be able to recreate those insights and distributions from real world data sets. Talking about some of the use cases that we see for synthetic data. One is with synthetic data, you have a unique ability to influence the output of that model. One of the things that we can enforce during the time that a model is being trained um, is, is privacy. We can make sure the model doesn't memorize rare secrets that might exist in the data, or that the model outputs data that could never be linked back to the original data that it was generated from. This helps address some of the biggest challenges that we have um, around data access and sharing today. And highlights the first use case that we see here. Number one, making data, private data accessible. One of the patterns we've seen talking with uh, tens or hundreds of customers at this point are increasingly decentralized development teams that are building in their own environments and incredibly empowered to build what they need to build. However, this uh, naturally creates data silos and it makes it difficult for data sharing to be possible. Even data sharing within the same team, for example, if you have a production application that has sensitive customer information, you might want to build a dev test or staging environment that you can use to simulate um, scale with your service, you can use to test your service. However, one of the big concerns you have is actually copying that sensitive production data into that pre-production environment. So one of the use cases that we can uh, dive in here is, is it possible to train a machine learning model on our production data, create a new anonymized version of that production data that could never be linked back to the individuals that the data was based on, but that would simulate the same type of dynamism and insights as the uh, original production data that was trained on. Number two, generating samples from limited data sets. In the age of big data, it's surprising that no one seems to have enough of the right type of data. So here we talk about this pattern of starting from just a few examples. For example, I'm a machine learning researcher and I'm training a chatbot on utterances or commands that might come from our users. And anytime there's a new type of utterance or command, perhaps the model hasn't seen that well before, is having a hard time with it. So they need to start from just a couple examples, but then generate a multitude of examples from that is a real challenge. An evolution of that thinking too is when you look across the typical data science project and how long it takes to, uh, to get access to the original data you need, sometimes having that data doesn't exist at all. So another neat use case for synthetic data are models that are trained on massive amounts of public information. Um, this could be on public location data, it could be on shopping cart behavior, it could be even examples of open source heart rate or EKG type monitors, and allowing you to compose your own data sets so you can quickly test your ideas on realistic synthetic data. Number three, this ability to influence a model and the type of output that it has, um, has allowed us to address some of the bigger challenges with machine learning today. So essentially what we've done is created a toolkit around synthetic data that you can use to influence the output of a model. And when you can do that, and this is something we'll dive into in our examples today, you have the ability to correct bias, you have the ability to influence the, uh, the distribution of data, um, which has implications anywhere from AI ethics to fairness. So 
So how big is synthetic data and what's new with it? And uh, it's rare that I put a Gartner uh, slide inside my presentations, but I think this is one that, uh, that uh, seems to highlight um, some of the potential for synthetic data very well. Here on the, in the diagram in front of us, we see that by the year 2030, Gartner predicts that AI models in the future will be completely overshadowed. Um, synthetic data will completely overshadow the use of real data inside of the model. How is this possible? <laughs> and what we're seeing today is we all, I think we all know that, that advanced machine learning models require a lot of data to work well. And when we get into some of the more advanced applications of machine learning today, whether it is speech recognition, whether it's self-driving cars, whether it's even kind of face recognition or things like that, there are infinite examples that exist in the real world. And a training set that can be used to, to, uh, to train a machine learning model is based on real world examples that have been annotated. This process can get very expensive, especially as you're working on the long tail, um, trying to improve your machine learning algorithm. Um, so how do you account for different, um, if you're creating something to recognize people's faces, how do you account for different um, shades, backgrounds, things like that? If you're working with voice, how do you account for background noises? How do you account for different uh, tonal variations in speech? The promise of synthetic data is the ability to work from just a few examples or an idea and to create a multitude, almost unlimited amount of examples of different permutations of that data that can be used to train machine learning algorithms. So when it comes to the generalization problem, how do algorithms learn to recognize data they've never seen before? Synthetic data is a very promising approach. A second potential um, trend that we're seeing too is with the trends that are happening in devices. So more work is being done on the compute, on your iPhone, for example, or on your Alexa than ever before. And what that means is less data is being sent to the cloud. So the traditional approach of annotating data in the cloud and using that to train your models isn't always possible because less data is being sent to the cloud. Some really positive privacy benefits here and really good things for consumers, but it's created a challenge um, for people building applications that, for example, need to understand your voice and need to work from there, where synthetic data will allow you to take advantage of a small amount of samples that you might have, an increasingly small amount of examples, but create algorithms that will generalize to new inputs extremely well. So here, we're going to pivot a little bit and start talking about the APIs that Gretel has built for synthetic data. And we're going to use these APIs in the next couple slides to, uh, to work on popular data sets. And, and we're going to take one particular example and address it both from an accuracy and a fairness perspective. At Gretel, we have three core APIs. Um, on the far left here, you see the area we spend the most time and our uh, research efforts around synthetic data. So here we talk about a couple of the advantages, but what Gretel is really trying to do is make data, synthetic data, APIs, not complicated, not scary, make it available to any developer, any person that wants to sign in and use it. So here on the left, you see synthetics. This can be language models, this can be GANs. We really believe there is no single bullet approach to creating synthetic data. Um, however, um, there is a lot that you can do to make it accessible. So anyone working with the data set, how do we create that to be part of the pipeline they have? for um, training a machine learning model. If they are trying to, uh, to enable access to a data warehouse or to a data set for another team, how do we allow you to really quickly de-identify so that it removes the known variables, names, addresses, things like that, um, and then synthesize, create a model that can be used to create unlimited amounts of data, either the same size and the shape as the original data or 10 times as many records, for example, if you wanted to have additional variations um, with different levels of privacy. And how do we help you find that right balance between privacy and accuracy for your downstream use cases? The two APIs here on the right, uh, transforms and the data classification and labeling, um, are a pre-processing step that we use with synthetic data. As I mentioned a second ago, it's really important to identify the known knowns inside of a data set. For example, if you are training a chatbot on customer service or uh, customer reviews, for example, you want that chatbot to learn from the semantics of the, uh, the, the data. You don't want to simply redact names though, and that would kind of send the chatbot down the wrong direction. So one of the options here are using the data classification APIs to identify PII, names, addresses, credit cards, things like that, that should never find their way into machine learning model. Transforms allow you to create a simple policy to replace that with a fake version. 
to encrypt it in place, to redact it, to drop the record. Really, you have a complete building block of, of different options here. And then finally, synthetics, which really gives you the finite control over what you want to do with that data. One of the top questions that we get around synthetic data is how accurate is it? And the use case being, if I'm trying to enable data access inside of my organization, and I want teams to be able to share data, I want teams to be able to access our awesome data warehouse, how do I make that possible? Question number one. Synthetic data is a promising approach for that, where you can create a, you know, a synthetic twin of your original data set that has increased privacy guarantees. And you as a developer inside your business, instead of waiting two weeks, four weeks, even six months, in some cases, as we've seen in the genomics world, to get access to data sets, what if I could get access to a data set right now that had 97, 98% the accuracy of the real world data? As a developer, as a data scientist, do I always need to see real names? Do I always need to see real addresses? The answer is, is no, often we don't. Um, traditional de-identification, that would be replacing names and addresses, but keeping the rest of the record the same, has been proven over and over again in the privacy space to have um, to be inadequate, really, to protect the privacy of the users that it's based on. Simplest example I could give would be uh, the Netflix challenge, for example, where a couple years ago, Netflix listed um, a competition on a data science platform, Kaggle, and they, they uh, de-identified 100 million different movie reviews. And they, they did an excellent job de-identifying this data set. It had only a movie ID and a user ID and a date and a number of stars that they gave for the, the movie. They ended up having to pull down the competition because some of the competition teams realized that just that combination of the date a review was done and a movie ID and a user was identifying enough um, that they could unmask the users by joining it with uh, movie reviews that they had seen, for example, on IMDb. So this is a real challenge. This is called a data linkage or re-identification attack. Synthetic data, how it helps get around this is it trains on the overall corpus of data and it creates a new corpus of data where none of those individual records are linked to a real record that might exist in a database somewhere else. So that's one of the real promises of synthetic data. The question is, how accurate is this new corpus of data that I created? And we wanted to go with some examples we thought would be right in line with, uh, with what you know, data scientists and developers are working with here. We took the eight most popular data sets on Kaggle. Um, so just looking at the, the hotness or the relevance uh, metric on, on Kaggle and used completely default parameters for, for Gretel Synthetics and created another data set of the exact same size and shape as the original real world data that it was trained on. Then we took, um, as you can see here, and we can dive into the details on how this worked, we ran um, each one of these on a downstream use case or task that was associated with this. So we took the top notebooks on Kaggle that were running on real world data and then we ran it on our synthetic version as well and we compared the results. And really exciting results here you see for just complete replacement, not augmentation, complete replacement of data. Here you see for stroke prediction, which we will dive into in later example, we actually saw an improvement here um, using the, the synthetic data. That means the model must have keyed or learned on something that um, helped with the downstream analysis. In some cases, you see a slight degradation in performance here. We can see on the data science job candidates use case and things like that. But really important thing is overall, just using our default parameters here, we had only a 2.58% um, decrease in accuracy between the, the real world data and the synthetic data that was created. So pretty exciting initial results here. So if we can get within 2.58% using our standard um, data classification, or, sorry, our standard synthetic data libraries, um, can we make it better and can we improve on real world data? And what types of problems are we seeing in this space right now anyways? Um, here I wanted to highlight just how powerful, and I think many people in this audience understand just how powerful machine learning uh, models are in our lives and um, how much they influence things increasingly day to day that are really important to us. These are based on data sets and often those data sets I think we all know are limited. Um, they may not have the right distribution of people that they're based on. They might be out of date um, all sorts of different things that can happen that, uh, that impact, you know, from a fairness perspective um, or an accuracy perspective, impact us in a very real way. A couple of the examples to call out here, you know, whether you're getting hired for a job or not, right? So um, 
organizations increasingly creating bots that will scan resumes and help with that like really manually intensive process of scanning resumes and selecting um, candidates that would be you know selected for a follow-on phone screen. Um, we've seen through examples that there was a famous kind of Amazon example where um, those models were um, largely focusing in on the data they were trained on, which was largely male candidates, and they were actually disqualifying different um, terms that uh, that female candidates uh, used inside of the resumes. So really dangerous um, example there. Medical use cases, diagnosing heart disease, things like that. Um, even the ability for us, you know, with a slightly different voice pattern, inflections or slang to talk to the devices around us. How do we make sure we have a good representation across all different possibilities of, of people and demographics and things like that to ensure that these algorithms are going to give us a fair response? Well, there is no bullet, but we have tools, and that's what we're going to dive into here and, and talk about how we might be able to make this better. Um, one of the times this was described to me really well by one of our customers um, who is uh, running a, a major uh, data science team for a, a really large uh, gaming company, so that if there are biases in the real world, in the virtual world, they're often magnified. And we want to make sure and provide a set of tools um, to help developers and data scientists here is to, is to help them influence this to minimize um, new biases being introduced and to create essentially the most fair experience possible. So it's, I think it's time now to jump into a, uh, a real use case. So we will provide some code. You're welcome to follow along and run this yourself. But you know, starting at one of those data sets we saw earlier, an extremely popular data set, one of the top five most popular data sets on data science platform Kaggle, um, is this heart failure prediction data set. Um, it was published by uh, the folks at UCI. So really incredible uh, data set. And um, you know, it's, it's been one of the canonical examples for, for data classification techniques uh, on this data science platform for quite some time. The question is, what is the distribution of the data that this was trained on? Like, where did this come from? Are there any gaps in this data that we might want to address? And if we can address those gaps, can we make a better data set? And better, if we use the definition here, could be either more accurate, so better overall performance for the data set, or more fair. Um, when you look at um, some of the different uh, categories inside of this data set. For example, uh, we look at age distribution. We look at, here they use the term um, sex for male or female. Um, if we look at the location the user came from, things like that, how do we make sure that those demographics are evenly balanced inside of the data set? If we do that, what impact does that have on the overall accuracy of our data? So what we're gonna do is we're going to train a synthetic model on this data set, and we're going to uh, create uh, essentially a, another version of this where we will balance out one of the attributes that stood out really quickly here. And here we see 32% female records, um, you know, over 68% uh, male records. So a, a theory here is that an algorithm trained on this data set would possibly index at, at um, over index on being really great at male heart disease detection and pay less attention to minority classes. For example, different age groups, different sexes, genders, things like that that might exist in the data. And if we balance this out, so essentially help the algorithm to create a, you know, a more fair response um, by boosting the representation, in this case, just a single attribute, we're gonna try boosting the, uh, the female representation. Like how does that affect overall performance? So diving right in, we'll provide links to run all this code yourself one of the areas that I like to do first is just run a parameter sweep. So what we did is we took this data set, loaded it in Gretel um, through a Python notebook, um, which we can walk through here, and we tried a set of different parameters. Really our goal here is maximum accuracy and maximum fairness. So how do we get there? You can use the default settings as we've shown earlier, which, which work quite well, or we can try a bunch of different parameters. We can try our downstream use case here. So I ran a standard uh, random forest classifier on the results and tried to predict heart disease detection with a purely synthetic data set. And here we can get a, a good feeling for which different sets of uh, APIs um, and configurations here work best. So we'll jump right over to the actual parameter sweep here and we can take a look. So here's one, uh, we had the best um, you know, classification accuracy here for the pure synthetic version here and we can see batch size relatively small number of epochs, um, a pretty conservative learning rate. Um, since this is a small data set, this is kind of interesting here, a smaller number of RNN units for this, um, this um, 
the synthetic data task and a vocabulary size. Um, so essentially allowing, we use uh, something out of the hood called sentence piece, which is built by uh, Google to, uh, to find uh, tokens within the input data. So using um, that versus pure character based tokenization seemed to work pretty well. So this is the configuration we're going to start with. Essentially, um, using this to train the, the neural network, we will have the neural network essentially output additional records so we can balance out the male and female class. And then we'll compare essentially the pure real world data to the real world data plus um, augmenting it with a, um, a balanced number of female and male records. Let's jump right over to that use case. Let's jump right into our example. So we'll go to docs.gretl.ai. From there, click on SDK Notebooks and go down to the bottom and you can see an example called Improve Accuracy Heart Disease. So we're going to go ahead and click that. This is going to open up a CoLab notebook that will walk us through our entire experiment. So here we see it loading up in the free Jupyter Notebook experience with CoLab. We'll go ahead and clear out the outputs that exist. Click Run All. So we're going to go ahead and run this. This will run the entire experiment using the parameters that we selected in the previous parameter sweep. While it's installing dependencies, we're going to go ahead and log into the Gravel console service here. We need to access the API key so the notebook knows how to talk to our cloud service. Go ahead and sign in with my Gmail ID. It's just about finished installing dependencies. Next, it's going to go ahead and ask for my API key, which we can go ahead and enter in. And copy that. As we can see here, the next step is loading up the train and test sets. So pulling down the, uh, the example heart disease data set from Kaggle, we did the 70-30 split, created two different sets. What we're going to be doing here is comparing the real world performance of the training set versus a train uh, set that's been augmented with synthetic data. So that's what we're going to do for the rest of this notebook. Let's go ahead and get it. Go ahead and let it run. So similarly to what we saw in the uh, original um, graph that we just showed in the, in the previous slideshow here, we see a big skew in distribution between male and female records. And what we're going to do here is create a synthetic model, train on the real world data set, tell it to boost the representation, in this case, of female records. And we're going to see how that data set performs against the original real world data. Next, we have a really important part. So what's happening here is we are training a synthetic model on the real world data set. So here you can see we're bringing in the Gravel client. Uh, we pull back the default configuration parameter. We'll make a few updates to match the parameters that we had from our parameter sweep. And here we're going to use a conditional data generation task. So this is a really kind of neat task with uh, more advanced machine learning models where I'm defining a single field, in this case, sex. You could define multiple fields. You could build something for a particular age range plus sex or different heart rate, you know, really any of the different features you wish. In this case, as we said, we're just going to be balancing out this, um, this sex attribute. We're going to define this as a seed task. This is the same thing as conditional model generation. Essentially, we are telling the model what type of record we want it to produce. And um, as we indicated earlier, we'll be telling it to, pr to produce additional female records to balance out the quantity of male versus female records in the training set. Why would we do this? I think is an important question. Like, why balance this out? Why not just gather more data? Often the, uh, the steps necessary to reproduce an experiment and get the same results um, become prohibitively expensive, if not impossible, to recreate. So often we are limited with the data that we have. And in this case, um, there was no way to go back and recreate additional, you know, heart patient experiments with the same methods and procedures that were used before. So this leaves us with the option of boosting the representation um, across that data set. In this initial run, we're going to tell it to generate 500 records. We can use that to look at the quality of the synthetic model, essentially generate data, throw the kitchen sink from a statistical perspective at the real world data versus synthetic, and we can compare the two. You can see here also we are turning off the default privacy filters. We're working with a really small data set here. We want to make sure we capture every insight. So in this case, where privacy filters often give very little um, actual real world accuracy hit, when we're going for maximum performance on a really small data set like this, um, in this case, we've uh, made the decision here to remove the similarity in the outlier filtering. This will create a new project in Gretel. 
um, called UCI heart disease, and we'll take a look at that in just a minute. We're going to go ahead and kick off training. So here we can say training is starting. What's happening is behind the scenes here, um, the, uh, the cloud um, is firing up a container with access to a GPU. Um, it's going to start processing this data set, and it's going to iterate over the data set until the model has effectively learned the parameters um, of the underlying data set. Let's go ahead and let that start. So here we can see it's loaded it up. Um, it has started creating uh, the, the data set. It's going to start creating the validators here in a minute. Essentially what validators do is they ensure that the output of the neural network matches the same types of uh, distributions um, as the original real world data. So one of the downsides of neural networks is they can output anything. When you're looking for high quality synthetic data, one of the things that we can do to, um, to make sure that it works better um, is to um, enforce that the somewhat random output of a neural network um, makes sense for your particular use case based on what we saw in the training data. Um, here we can see it trained for about 44 epochs. I sped this up a few minutes just so you guys didn't have to wait through it. Here we see 44 epochs. We see very good accuracy, so we're at you know 90% prediction accuracy. Loss is very small, so you want to see accuracy going up. You want to see loss going down. Uh, we're looking good on that. We had to generate 500 records, um, so it's just starting that record generation process now. This invalid count, what you're seeing here, is some of these records um, didn't pass validation. So something about that record, whether a, a floating point number was too high or uh, a new category was invented that didn't exist, something like that occasionally happens. We'll see that being dropped. As that um, data set's being generated here, we're going to go back to the Gretel console and we can see this model. And let's go ahead and take a look at the performance of this model and how it's doing. So the model trained pretty quickly. We can see the records being generated just like what you're seeing in the Python notebook over there. and record generation is complete. At the end, we generate a synthetic quality score. You can see here is very good, so we're happy with our ability to re reproduce the insights and distributions of the original data. Privacy protection level is much lower since we turned off the default privacy mechanisms. Looking through here, we see a quick summary of the privacy statistics and then diving right into the accuracy, which is so important to us. This is one of my favorite graphs to look at. What we see here are uh, the correlation graphs that exist between the training uh, data, so the correlations that sat in the original training set, and the synthetic data set. And um, what we're looking for is how closely is it able to match that. You don't want to recreate it exactly, you want to match the, the correlations. So here, where we see stronger correlations, for example, between these two different um, sensor readings here, um, we want to see them be as close as possible. We see 0.41 in the training data. It looks like synthetic correlation may have been slightly stronger in this case, but still very close at a 0.45. This is the second one of my favorite graphs to look at, uh, principal component analysis. This really helps you understand that um, whether the model overfit on a few features in the data or if it was able to kind of recreate some favorite in a data, data science toolkit, um, whether it was able to recreate the, uh, the same type of dimensionality um, as the original data. So we're looking for distributions and shape between these two different features to be very similar. Looking at that, even for such a small data set that we're working with here with only uh, a little bit over a thousand rows, um, we see it learned it pretty well. We see the distribution shape being just about the same. So it's another kind of sense of confidence that um, it learned the distribution fairly well. Finally, when we're looking at per field or per column distributions, um, we've got the, uh, the, the field distribution plots. This shows you for every value in the synthetic data set we've created versus the data that was trained on, like how closely are we matching the distributions? You don't want this to match exactly. What you're looking for um, are patterns that are close, but not the same. We see a nice, um, you know, kind of Gaussian look um, on some of these uh, distributions, which is very good. Um, so we see things being close, but not quite the same. The intent of this report is really to give you a sense of confidence that yes, like this data set, um, this synthetic model, like learned the nuances of my data and is able to recreate it. We tasked the model to create enough records, so we created a total of 2,000 records here that we're using to augment our original training set, that we would create an even distribution between male and female records here. So here's our augmented data set, synthetic plus training data. Uh, we'll take a look at it very close within one, um, so that was a math error on my part. And next thing we're going to do is run a set of, of data classification tasks on there. So we're comparing, in this case, we're comparing real-world data versus our augmented uh, synthetic data set, and we're comparing the accuracy for a set of downstream um, classifiers. So does this patient, particular patient, in the test data set that we isolated at the very beginning, 
have heart disease or not. Um, really encouraging results that you see here as we go through here. So um, we took six, or I guess in this case, five of the more popular classifiers that are out there, random forest, decision trees, XGBoost, SVM. And we ran the classification task, as you can see here, for each one of these. On the left, you see real world data. The accuracy for predicting heart disease here in this case with random forest was 95% on this data set. So pretty good accuracy. Um, the really cool and inspiring thing here is we actually see an increase in uh, synthetic data um, accuracy. So when we're using our synthetic data set on um, four out of five use cases here. So support vector machine, for some reason, the accuracy from our synthetic model was slightly lower. But in many of these cases, using this boosted data set with an equal number of male and female patient records, uh, we're able to achieve just as good, um, if not better, um, accuracy that we did with the real world data. Going on a little bit more, now we're going to take a look at the distributions, um, not just um, at accuracy, but let's take a look at fairness. So essentially, we're going to break down some of those minority classes. In this case, we're going to take a look at the, uh, the, the sex attribute and see for, for males and for females across synthetic data and real world data, which one performed the best. We'll jump back over to the slides so we can see this a little bit better. So we'll jump back into the slides here and take a look at the results from our notebook. So pretty exciting results. As we saw here just a second ago, we see um, improvements in four out of five classifiers working with the augmented data set versus the real world data. Um, and pretty close here, so about a 1.3% improvement in accuracy, which is pretty substantial coming from an 88.97% um, start. So pretty exciting. Looking at the... Um, class distribution here. And this is where you start looking at fairness. Like how well did the algorithm work for different, um, in this case, we're looking at the, uh, the sex attribute inside of the data set, um, which was defined as male and female. Um, how well did we perform here? So in the light colored blue on the left here, we see um, real world male performance, um, heart disease using the real world data set versus um, the augmented data set. So we see like, for example, with random forest, see a 1% um, improvement here. Um, and we see with random forest, the female heart disease detection staying um, very consistent. However, across the rest of the algorithms here, you see sometimes really substantial improvements here. Um, SVM is up nearly 15% in heart disease detection for females. Um, XGBoost, which is, uh, you know, I think widely regarded as a, as a really excellent classification algorithm, you know, the, uh, the accuracy went from 96.63% to 100% for female to heart disease detection using this, like, augmented synthetic data set. So really encouraging results across um, the board for females. As you can see here at the top, we had a 4.49% improvement in heart disease um, and 1.25% improvement um, for males, uh, resulting in an average 1.3% improvement across the entire data set. So really exciting um, and something that many of the, the customers we're working with right now are working on, like how do we build better, build better data sets? How do we automate this process? Um, and, uh, and create kind of the, the most fair and inclusive responses that we can. If you'd like to run through any of this stuff yourself, um, feel free. We've got tons of, of open source examples. Um, it's free to use Gradle. We have a developer tier. So you've got um, uh, several hours of compute that you can use for free. Um, or you can deploy Gradle and run inside your own environment as well. So uh, here's a link to a YouTube channel. I will drop links to our note notebooks and our docs um, below, but docs.gretl.ai works as well. Um, if you have any questions, would like to follow up on your use case, ask any questions um, and, and have a discussion, either join us on our community Slack, where many of us spend a lot of our time. Um, you can get to that at gretl.ai uh, slash Slack invite, um, or um, reach out to us at hi at gretl.ai. Thank you very much for your time.